Hello, my name is David Spencer, and this is my capstone project submission for the Harvard Office of the Vice Provost for Advanced Learning, FinTech Online Short Course. For my submission, I have chosen to examine problem number four, the cryptocurrency and blockchain bubble. Have things gone too far? In this case, we are asked to discern between reasonably practical use cases for blockchain technology and far-fetched or more dubious cases. And how should the professional evaluate the difference between the two? Further, we are directed towards Kodak and Long Island Ice-T to question if they are using technology for technology's sake or if they are actually solving a problem using the latest technology. Again, my name is David Spencer and let's get started. To begin, let's outline the issue. Investment managers have a new asset class on their plate. And as with any asset class, there are both a knowledge base and a technical skill set that go into evaluating the asset class. So the question remains, how should the professional evaluate digital assets in a robust way? There are numerous problems presented by blockchain companies. The first of which is that thin history. So they have not been around long enough to give us that much to examine. So how should we move forward? Let's explore. We can begin with traditional techniques. Let's gather information from both public and private sources. We can start with fundamental analysis. Is there really a business there? We can move forward into traditional technical analysis, which is complicated by some unique items in the blockchain and emerging technology field, which we will examine. Then we can look at on-chain analysis. On-chain analysis is unique to blockchain and digital asset firms, as well as the tokenomics. Tokenomics refers to, is a new field of behavioral economics that, uh, that seeks to discern the differences and the effects of different incentive models in cryptocurrency asset issuance. The primary source of information on any digital asset is the white paper. If you come across a digital asset offering, or a cryptocurrency related firm and they do not have a white paper, a yellow paper or a beige paper, you should turn the other way. And this is the fundamental step in understanding how they operate. Oftentimes they can include very technical language. Uh, and you may want to consult someone who has those technical skills. From a, block, from a business perspective, we are looking to see if there is a business model there. Often, Novel uses of blockchain do not e equate to profitable, profitable business models. And so once you have in fact determined that there is a business model there, then we can move on and gather some more additional information. We can use publicly available information. There is a great deal of information that we can discern from publicly available sources, including regulatory bodies that may be interested in uh, the company we are exploring. Um, there is industry specific information as well, depending on what type of firm you are examining. And a thing to look out for is tech for tech's sake. Are they just doing the same thing and we're adding in the complexity of a blockchain? Or is that additional complexity actually solving a business problem? Are we reducing friction? Is there a value add there? Because again, Novel uses of blockchain do not always equate to profitable business models. Some of the places we can look for information as far as digital assets and coins are Coin Market Cap, Coin Desk, and those that I've laid out here. There is there are key opinion leaders that can be found on YouTube. These are very influential in the space at the moment. I think that as more institutional money comes into the space, the influence of the key opinion leaders on YouTube and platforms like that will diminish and we will find more professional evaluation of the digital asset space. We can also look again towards regulatory bodies um, that can give us information on the environment in which the digital assets are operating. An important thing to note when we examine digital assets and blockchain related firms is that we must vet the team. 
And in vetting the team, we have to examine them from both a technological standpoint, do they have the technological skill set, and do they have the business acumen to execute the plan that they've laid out for, for us here? And there is, in fact, a difference between the two. Those are two very different metrics. We should look at all the different press releases and make sure that they are consistent, that the message has remained consistent throughout the time that the asset has been in place. It is important that the firm be able to produce reliable financial statements. This not only shows that they are capable of doing so, but it also shows that the team has a respect for financial reporting and financial reporting standards. Once we have gathered the necessary information, we have to find a way to make it useful. We can begin with traditional fundamental analysis, economic market analysis, look at the set of aforementioned financial statements, examine the competition from both a blockchain and a non-blockchain perspective. Often blockchain firms hope to interrupt industries that uh, are bread and butter and gaining the momentum to undercut very long-standing firms could be an obstacle that requires further examination. Again, traditional SWOT and pestle analysis and ensure we have a profit model. Uh, a profitable coin does not necessarily equal a profitable business. There's a great deal of speculation in the industry and it can carry a less than, uh, a less than profitable business model to heights that are not really reasonable from a valuation perspective. Once we have completed our fundamental analysis, we can go more towards a technical analysis. And there are unique patterns to cryptos, but traditional fund a technical analysis and charting methods can be utilized in the digital asset space. Tradition, more specifically on a, on a small scale, from a micro perspective on a day-to-day -day basis, we see that traditional charting patterns and traditional charting techniques, traditional behavioral examination of the markets do hold. From a more zoomed out perspective, when we look at macro trends, we've got to take a much broader look and think about things unique to the crypto space. There is an oft repeated pattern called that I have dubbed the double rally plateau, which we will examine a little bit later. And an, an interesting thing to consider is the, the presence of strong hands in the digital asset space. There are a number of people and professionals as well who have seen enough of the markets who stand in a demographic between late 20s, early 30s, early 40s um, to their early 40s that have seen the market in a number of different phases and they are emotionally unmoved by those machinations of the market and are not in current need of income, are not extremely high earners, but are not in current need of income and it makes them a strong hand in the marketplace. And they are what is termed a hodler. And a hodler is holding on for dear life, H-O-D-L. And they are very strong hands and they accumulate a dollar cost average in and are traditionally very savvy and sophisticated investors. Um, they can affect market behavior. Next, we will examine the double rally plateau. This is the double rally plateau that is a tradition, is a very oft repeated chart in the crypto, crypto asset space. It is two rallies on volume, followed by a plateau somewhere near the middle of, somewhere near the bottom of the rally that occurred. The plateau continues on accumulation. Continued accumulation is also another, uh, another indicator, another facet of this particular chart. Um, the plateau on not on less than accumulated or falling accumulation is a slightly different indicator. This is a bullish chart for a long-term uh, long hold. 
also provided the firm has strong fundamentals and other analysis. Unique to digital assets and unique specifically because we have the ability to track every single transaction on a blockchain is on-chain analysis. And on-chain analysis is the study of network metrics surrounding the blockchain and capital flows moving on it. HODL waves, HODL waves refers to the age at which a blockchain, uh, a coin has been held. Coins that have been held for a long time and then begin to move, they give us information about hodlers, about people who are holders of the asset and have shown a propensity to be a strong hand. When those assets tend to move, it gives us an information about the marketplace. Free floating supply, oftentimes there are digital assets that are locked or staked in a particular protocol or platform. The free float supply tells us more about the actual number of coins that are in the marketplace and transacting. The percentage and profit. The percentage and profit tells us information about the number of wallets that are holding coins and they sit in a profitable stance. When we see a large rally and a large number of, of wallets in a profitable position, that is a bearish sign in the sense that there may be people interested in taking profit. There are a number of on-chain analysis research services providers and a number of free services. Uh, a couple are listed here, Chain Analysis and Ready, Set, Crypto. Tokenomics. The tokenomics is the study of how the cryptocurrency is working within a broader ecosystem and the incentive models used to encourage positive behavior within the platform or network. An important example of these is the miner. The miner is incentivized to validate valid transactions and incentivize uh, proper use of the network by the small amount of Bitcoin they are earn, they earn for validating valid transactions. Uh, that is important. Another piece of the tokenomics are the metrics that are used in, in evaluating the tokenomics. How many will there be? the divisibility of the token itself, uh, the speed of the token, the particular protocol that it is using. Um, there are a number of, the, at this point, a number of different blockchain-based protocols from proof of work, proof of stake, uh, federated Byzantine agreement, hash graph, and others are still in development. This tokenomics element encourages a strong element of behavioral economics into the digital asset space. And as incentives become stronger and become enforceable or incentivized by governments, that will be an interesting behavioral study within the digital asset space. We've gone through both technical fundamental analysis. We've completed on-chain analysis as well as understood the tokenomics of the particular asset we are examining. Now it's time to weigh that analysis, to examine the pros and cons, and see if we are, our initial analysis has led us down any other aspects with which we need to examine from a professional perspective. Our time horizon of our investment, the trade volume which, which we'd like to trade, and there is an important thing to consider. If you are making a large investment in the digital asset space, you may be considered a whale. And if you are moving a large amount of information, a uh, large amount of tokens, you can wake the giant. You can kind of tip off the other investors, which, which, may, which may be trying to trail off the information you have discerned. Um, you can look at numerous examples of firms buying digital assets on the sly so as not to tip off other investors for their corporate treasuries. Once we have taken all the conclusions from fundamental, technical, on-chain, and tokenomic analysis, we must weigh these items and make a determination if there should be an investment made or if we should hold off. And we should also con consider the sentiment. Sentiment is very important in the nascent market and when we have speculators in the marketplace. There are a number of promising use cases for blockchain. 
including finance and lending, which is kind of low-hanging fruit. Um, real estate record keeping. Stable databases are a primary use, primary use for blockchain protocols, and they allow a great deal of flexibility in, in uh, exchanging that information. The gaming industry is maybe a perhaps often underestimated use of the blockchain protocol. Its users there are very comfortable with digital representations of value and maybe early adopters. Voting is waiting on perhaps a digital identity protocol, but that could be a very promising use case. Some of the things that we might want to consider when we think about use cases for blockchain that are not as viable are recreate are any time when we're recreating the wheel using text for text's sake or are a solution looking for a problem. These are hard to weed out because the founders and believers in it are going to present with us, present us opportunities and examples that may seem like low hanging fruit, but it, we must take a sober analysis and examine if we're adding additional complexity but with the blockchain or if we're actually solving a problem. An important point with blockchain will be digital identity. There are numerous blockchain use cases that will be waiting on a robust digital identity platform, and that platform may be required to come from some type of government regulatory agency. So we should keep our eyes on that type of use case. We can make a quick study of Nexus Mutual. Nexus Mutual is a provider of insurance to users of smart contracts. As smart contract adoption increases and firms want to insure against that loss, their profit model seems viable. This is a mutual insurance format where coin holders and buyers of the contract can vote on claims to assist in the smooth operation of the network. This is also part of the tokenomics to incentivize positive behavior. A, fun, a full technical analysis is beyond the scope of this project, but the protocol is based on DLT systems and is in compliance with MetaMask protocols. As a new project, on-chain analysis does not exist and the, the permission for that analysis does not exist to this research. The tokenomics of Nexus Mutual allow, incentivizes token holders to participate in the platform and assist in the smooth, the smooth insuring and the smooth uh, adjusting of the insurance claims on the platform. The insurance is a bedrock industry. Uh, I often lean towards use cases for blockchain that are fundamental to other industries being adopted. Uh, insurance is found in many, many blocks of life. And as we go digital, we will need digital insurance to match. So I think that insurance is an important use case, both in commercial insurance and health insurance eventually, as well as health information. In conclusion, digital assets present an amazing opportunity for growth in principle over the coming decade in financial investment portfolios. I do believe it is an arena for strong hands and long-term investment horizons. Regulatory clarity will be important and on-chain analysis provides the professional important and robust tool to make decisions and gain information. Use cases abound, some of which are low-hanging fruit, but we should be careful for text for text sake and solutions looking for a problem. There are a number of different large monetary authorities exploring digital assets and we should keep an eye on those because the future is coming. So from a professional standpoint, we should get ready. Thank you very much for your time. And I hope you have enjoyed my examination and our outline for the examination of digital assets by the profession. Thank you very much.